Um, I have a teeny little opening. I figured I would just talk about, for people that don't know the business of Broadway or the economics, and there is sort of a tiny, a little official statement from the Broadway League, and then I'm going to leave it to you to start asking questions. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think we're, uh, people are now starting to join um, our conversation. So first of all, um, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, um, I'm here with uh, Wendy Fetterman. I think uh, a large part of this session would be just to read her bio, okay? Uh, which is exciting. But just before I get there, uh, just an opening. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here in Rye, New York. And you are where, Wendy? Hamptons. Hamptons. And everybody are somewhere. And um, um, this is uh, basically a series of, of uh, discussions uh, with phenomenal, at least I think, phenomenal first generation, next generation entrepreneurs, people that are strong, people that have been through crisis, people that have uh, and, and dealt with it, people that have passion, people that never stop. And I think these are the people we need to hear from. And each of those that I speak with is from a different world. I spoke to Anthony Scaramucci and Tal Garrett. This week is more art and performing arts and film and Broadway. I'm speaking with you now, and then I'm speaking to Nancy Spielberg later on this week. And next week with uh, Uri Levine and Dov Moran, some of Israel's largest, most exceptional entrepreneurs, and on and on. So I will not bore you with that right now. Maybe I'll say a couple of words at the uh, end. Um, and Wendy is, it's going to be so interesting. Wendy is, um, I know her for uh, many years, not enough, but, but really uh, several years, third generation of a family business that she was part of, never really was too excited about what's going on with that. I mean, it wasn't her passion. And the second, and she'll correct me if I'm wrong or not, they sold, she went after her dream and passion, which is Broadway, to become, now let me read this just to give you an idea, a nine-time Tony Award winner, right? For hair, Pippin, all the way, the curious incident of the dog in the night time, dear Evan Hansen, hello Dolly, Angela in America and the band's visit, which is from Israel, by the way, originally, and uh, Headstone. I think my father, by the way, my father is a famous guitar player. He was involved in the music for the band's visit, by the way. Twenty-five. Oh, I know that. Yeah, 25 additional Tony Award nominations. Uh, um, uh, Olivier Award winner for company, three additional Olivier Awards nominations. Uh, working on loads of new upcoming, I'll let you talk about that, of course, Broadway productions uh, and off-Broadway productions. And, uh, and if I'll keep on reading, we'll just spend the days reading all the projects you're involved with. So first of all, um, uh, good morning, Wendy. Good morning, Danny, it's good to see you. Yeah, difficult uh, days. Uh, we just started the conversation and you told me about another name that, that uh, fortunately died. and. 30-year-old jogger, which is crazy. Um, and here we are. Um, Broadway shut down uh, completely like other uh, sectors. And maybe, I don't know, maybe we should start with your life story, maybe. Or you came from a family business and you went into Broadway. So just before we touch Broadway, maybe you can share with us. Uh, of course. I'm um, third generation in a uh, business. My grandfather started. My father took over and then my brother and I uh, took over. Uh, we manufactured ribbon for the floral and craft trade. Uh, it actually, my grandfather started it with hat binding and then after World War II, it went into the ribbon industry that really catered to the floral and craft trade. And then my father in the late fifties branched it out into import starting from Asia and then and Europe as well. Again, items for the floral and craft trade. Uh, my brother, my brother's older, he went into it at first then I wound up, I, my mother was a Broadway radio and television actor. My mother, my aunt was a film actress and agent. My uncle was the voice of Boris Badenoff from the Jolly Green Giant and the Pillsbury Doughboy. So I was sort of divided when I was young, uh, trained actor, dancer, all of that. But I enjoyed my, my father's business and loved, loved him dearly and his company. So I was sort of always interested in both, both facets of it. Uh, make a long story short, my dad passed right after I graduated university, where fortunately I had agreed, made a deal with him that I would take business courses as well as my arts courses. So I went into the business because it was, again, just my brother and, and myself. My mom was around, but she never really worked in the business and was acting since she was young. Uh, 
sold my share of the business uh, about 12 years after that. Um, I spent a lot of time traveling. I really was more involved with the import area and with a lot of the trade shows. And I was very fortunate that when I got out of the business, I, uh, I have a practice. I started, I wanted to go back into the theater world, but I also had two children. So I have a, I had a psychotherapy practice. I'm a biofeedback therapist, but I turns out always kept my relationships with a lot of people in theater. And when my son was two years old in a play group and one of the kids' dads was a Broadway producer and also had two off-Broadway theaters at the time. And I was always going to the theater. I was always the one in the neighborhood that everybody called in August, September. What shows do we see? What do we buy? What do we do? In the old days, before the internet, when you would, I would, you know, tear it out of the New York Times and say, okay, we got to see this show, this show. This is with kids. This is with, with hubbies. Um, so I was always staying, keeping a foot in that arena. But our, this producer friend of mine uh, and his wife, they saw my interest and they really kicked me and said, this is what you should be doing. You'd make a great producer. And back then I left. They left when I said, what does a producer do? The same way I left now when somebody asked me because it is so multi-layered. Uh, but my children were still young. So I, I met more people. I invested in shows and around 2005, six, I really started, um, my kids were older and I started moving into the arena. And I'm not sure if I'm up to over 80 Broadway shows or not, but I segued a couple years ago out of my therapy practices and working on this full time. And one of the sadder things for me is that the wife of that producer who mentored me in this business, she passed about three, three weeks ago. That was, um, brought a lot of reality to the situation, a long time friend, but I know many people have lost. But I was very blessed to have my, my love and my passion and something that I grew up with circle back to me in my life. So I may not be on the stage, but I understand what's on the stage and I understand the material and how to read it and can read music, can play music. But I've had those years of business experience, which were very helpful because, um, you know, we're looking at numbers all the time. And I actually think my years of being uh, a stress management therapist have come in very helpful as well. If you've ever sat in on any of the meetings uh, and just dealing with people. So I, I feel very blessed that my passion is my work. And, you know, I, I love Broadway. I love entertainment business, uh, the people that I've worked with. And I'm here to be its chief ambassador and say that we will be back back and better than ever, but it's going to be a, a journey. And by the way, do you do film as well or Broadway? I have done film actually. I did a wonderful film with Brian Cranston uh, called Lakefield. And I actually have a couple of things brewing at the moment that may, uh, by nature of how business and the entertainment business is going to go, may happen before, faster, may get, you know, fast track. I have one or two theater projects that may wind up, uh, that I've been working on developing, that may wind up being filmed or recorded live and then wind up on a live stream situation because obviously there's a whole uh, more emphasis now on the delivery of entertainment and more people, especially more people, uh, you know, let's say 50 and older, who may not have always relied on their computers and their phones and their iPads to be entertained, uh, we're now, our generation is a little more educated in how to do that. And, um, well, I guess we have a lot of questions about uh, Broadway and your experience. Uh, I don't know if you should uh, jump ex right to the questions that are, you know, kind of uh, expected. People want to know, People that, you know what's I know going on. Well, let me, I'm going to give a teeny background just on Broadway for people that haven't heard me speak or don't really know, because a lot of people go to a show and they see the big, the, the brilliant lights of Broadway, but they don't realize what a substantial business it is and what Broadway really means to New York City and really the country. First of all, Broadway is one of New York City's largest and important employers. Uh, New York City alone is over 87,000 uh, people that Broadway employs, uh, going forward, think about then all the tangential business around. We, last year, our theater season of 2018-19, we took in about $1.8 billion, and we brought about 
over $14 billion to the economy of New York, keeping in mind the restaurants, the stores, the hotels, all the other businesses that because Broadway existed, uh, people uh, either had a business, made money, booked business, and, and not only for New York City, but the national tours. Because of Broadway, there is a world of national tours that goes out that is supportive of theaters around the country. So think of, of the theaters that uh, are bringing in the new shows and what goes on in their cities and those restaurants and, 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 and the economics of those areas. So the health, so Broadway, it's not just about the actual show, but it's what we do bring to New York City and to the nation and as, as an art form and as a business. Uh, also, uh, I want to just let everybody know the Broadway League is our trade organization. They represent the theater owners, producers, presenters in North America, and the general managers. And obviously, this is our representational, our, our league. And they've come up with a, we've got sort of a motto or a, a, a statement that we're, we're making. Some of you may have already seen it on social media of how, how we're talking about what's going on. And we are calling this time, hashtag, only intermission. I will read you, it's a short, and if you hear it on social media, it's Lin-Manuel Miranda who's saying it, obviously way better than I will. But let me just read this to you because any of us who work in theater and live entertainment agree with it. We love you, we miss you, and we want nothing more than to be with you again for you to see us act, sing, and dance. For right now, the only way to stick together is to be apart. But remember, this is only intermission and everyone loves a great second act. So as you go through your Instagrams and Facebooks and wherever, uh, and possibly going forward um, when the time is right, part of the, uh, the TV and media campaigns, but at only, uh, hashtag only intermission. And that's how we're looking at it. Broadway will be back and it will be bigger and fabulous and wonderful. But on March 12th, uh, around 5 p.m. in the afternoon, as I was, and many, a few of, many of us were getting ready to go to the opening night of a fabulous new musical, Six, I'm proud to be involved with, we all got the message, don't come to the theater, Broadway is shut down. Uh, we knew something was brewing that day. There was a big meeting at the league with, uh, you know, a handful of producers, government officials, Broadway League, and... It was the correct decision, obviously, but um, heartbreaking. And I don't know if any of us thought that here we are today, uh, April 20th. And, you know, it, it, it certainly got way worse than anybody, than most of us anticipated or were led to anticipate. But we're here and we will be back. And it's the same thing in other places, right? I mean, West End is closed as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. London closed down, I believe, about a week after us. I believe, you know, of course, the national tours, every city made their own decision. But I believe once we shut down Broadway, we called back in. Uh, because even though they're national, we, they, they're, they still are under the auspices of the mother company of each show. You know, the, the number one consideration was the health and well-being of our actors and everybody behind the, the, the set. There were people, actors here from uh, London, you know, who lived other places, and we wanted to give everybody the opportunity to go home. You know, what's quite wonderful now, at least, is everybody, because of uh, Zoom meetings and Instagram, everybody is able to stay in touch with, it, with everyone, cast members and us partners and all of us, because, uh, you know, we host Zoom meetings and Zoom get-togethers just to, to be on top of it. You know, many of our... Uh, I don't know, again, maybe Nancy will speak to it, what happened on film and television sets, but think of how close uh, actors in a show work together, you know, sharing dressing rooms, uh, dancing together, being in close together. So, you know, and, and uh, fortunately, almost all of our, you know, no, not too many bad situations, a couple, but, um, you know, the number one was, the number one thing was to make sure that uh, our, our own family of theater people were protected. And then of course, audiences and, and our own families. And we wanted to be sure that everybody got to where they wanted to go in a safe way and had the time to do that. And, 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 and Broadway, it seems, uh, you know, is obviously in a very difficult um, place because, you know, even if you look at the film industry, 
right? So you can take a film and worst case postpone, obviously some productions or all productions are stuck, but at least you can do right. that. Here, you're talking about live performances, people that bought tickets. Um, there were 16 shows, you know, at the theater we usually talk about a fall season and a spring season. And there were 16 sh uh, new shows, plays and musicals, that were scheduled to open in the spring season. Some wonderful stuff coming up. Some, a few of them I was proud to be, in, I'm proud to be involved with, but others, some things I was really looking forward to seeing. Um, outside of six that was opening that night, there were a couple of shows that were in previews. Uh, a show I'm involved with called The Minutes, a new Tracy Letts was opening that Sunday night. So we were very much in the previews. We were in critics' performances, company, uh, with Patti Lapone and Katrina Link was opening the following Sunday exactly, and we scheduled the date for Stephen Sondheim's 90th birthday, you know, very particularly. Uh, but you had, you know, many, many other shows. So what's happened is out of those 16, two of them, for their own reasons, not that I, ones I haven't been involved with, have decided, you know, we're done. That's it. We're, we're, we're not waiting it out. I believe another two or three of them, which are uh, under the auspices of uh, the not-for-profits, I believe one of Lincoln Center's Broadway show and two roundabouts, they operate a bit differently than most than commercial theater. They've just postponed them to next season. So whenever the season does open, they'll just pick up and start from there. So that leaves about 11 more new shows that were scheduled to come in. Uh, I had a new musical, Sing Street, that was gonna be opening Sunday night, the 16th and another fabulous play cut that uh, circled in from London was at the Armory last year, the Lehman Trilogy, which we were just on our fourth preview performance. So that was just the new from the spring that had yet to open. And we're not even discussing Off-Broadway, where there were dozens of productions uh, between the downtown theaters, BAM, you name it, some really great stuff that was happening that, um, you know, in every show, every, every theater company, whether it's a not-for-profit theater company or every commercial show, will uh, make its own decisions, certainly about if they're, when, if they're taking that production to go on. Obviously, the major decision about when Broadway comes back is going to come from uh, our governor. And, and then what, what's going on right now? I mean, you, you, you have... People that bought tickets, are they getting refunded? Uh, people running after you probably, after producers to get their in investment back, or I don't know what. Uh, you have the uh, all the venues that obviously charge. What's going on? Are you getting relief? Well, money I will say from this. State? What's going on? I am my number one investor, but and I my, my family of investors have been absolutely fabulous because everybody knows and understands it's not only uh, Broadway, but many other uh, uh, entertainment, but many other arenas of private invest of investment where we're all watching the news. We all know what's going on and uh, everybody's been incredibly wonderful. And the first thing that everybody's emailing back is, how are you? How is your family? It's really been, you know, I think we're in a moment right now where uh, the universe is having us really remember and think about what com what is important and what comes first. So I'm very blessed, and I, I, but I've been hearing that around in terms of investors. Now, as far as ticket buyers, because we're, we're sort of separate from the ticket buyers in that if, when ticket buyers buy their tickets on Telecharge, Ticketmaster, whatnot, they're holding the money. So since Broadway was now, it was announced that June 7th, it wasn't announced that June 7th would be a reopening date. It was announced that, that there would be no shows till June 7th. So all the, vent, all the platforms where anybody purchased their ticket from, they are responsible to give the money back. So it might take a little while. I'm sure they're pretty overwhelmed. I know for myself, I had quite a few off-Broadway shows lined up. So um, I've been receiving some emails stating, you know, oh, you were just credited, you were seeing something at this theater and you were seeing something at that theater. And again, uh, that it will happen. I just don't think it's gonna, it may not happen expeditiously, but again, I think we're all finding that with the credit card companies as well, if you don't get your refund right away, the credit card companies are also showing more time leniency. But understand that, you know, that we, we, we the producers, we the show are not, physically holding your money. It's a long process of the, the collection agent 
to the to the theater owners to us it, it, it just goes a different route you know we collect we make money when we perform so uh, again people have really been I would say certainly in my world have been really wonderful and have really been inquiring more about how everybody is how the actors are how the backstage staff is doing how everybody is and understanding that, uh, you know, I, I find for myself with my investors, I do my best to keep everybody very informed. I send out emails. If I have tidbits on shows, you know, like what are act, what different actors in different shows are up to, what they're doing. I've also been personally very involved in, in some fundraising efforts for my community in the theater world. I was involved uh, with a, 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 we put together a, a matching fund for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS which um, feeds out to people in our uh, world that are gonna be in need, whether it's for health reasons, economic reasons. Then there's the Actors Fund, which is another wonderful uh, organization that takes care. And you don't have to be an actor. You can be anybody that's worked in, in, the, in, the, in the entertainment, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, again, you know, in addition to you know, helping out local, our, my local hospitals and whatnot. But in terms of just the industry, uh, more people, fortunately, are, have, have their hearts, their brains and their hearts have merged. And people are really concerned with um, how everybody's doing. And I think there's way bigger issues, even with investors. You know, we're all looking at what the, mar what the market's doing and what other, other arenas are doing. And looking, everyone's got their own individual priorities. And then when you're looking, just so we understand how it works, so the theater, they get a yes. cut from, from the profits and a rent that they charge you. And then what they, what's going on right now? Are they expecting you guys to pay as if nothing well, happened? Well, what, or? Happened was, what happened was, and you know, again, I'm, I, I'm going to speak in more generalities. When, you know, obviously the main thing that each show wanted to do, and again, remember yeah, every show is its own, it's its own business. No one show is related to another one. Uh, they're all individual LLCs or LPs you know, would look at was, um, the deals were made with the unions, you know, the, uh, the actor unions, all the different unions that, that work to make a Broadway show happen. So those deals were set and those monies were, you know, have been taken care of. Then with the landlords who have been, you know, amenable and agreeable, and obviously the theaters are closed. There is a rent that is being paid out much, not the rent that would be paid if the shows were open, but there is a weekly expense. There is a weekly expense. And again, it, it's every show is different. Every theater is different. It's a smaller theater, bigger figure uh, uh, theater. So there is a, a weekly expense, but it's, it's an ongoing conversation and the theater owners are terrific. And remember the theater owners themselves are producers, you know, oh, they have stakes in a lot of the shows as well. So everybody, you know, everybody, we're all kind of in this together. We want to see our, our, our shows come back. And there were a lot of shows that were, you know, that are in plans that were just, um, had done their workshop, that were just uh, getting ready to go do an out of town run so they could come in maybe next year or next season. You know, there's so much now we don't know. And mostly we don't know it because we don't know when the green light's gonna go on, just say go. And, uh, and what about insurance? Where did they come to place here in this whole thing? It's insurance is interesting. It's uh, obviously again, I don't have access to each every show's insurance policy, but every show, as most businesses do, you take out a business interruption policy. Um, in fact, the word is that the insurance industry is looking uh, potentially looking for bailouts similar to the airline industry because they're going to get you know, it's not just our in, it's not just us, it's other industries as well. Um, Different shows have different policies. Fortunately, my shows I'm involved with have very strong policies. You know, we don't know how force majeure is going to be involved. You know, all the paperwork has been done. It's been filed. As far as I know, nobody's been turned down. But again, think of any, if you've had an, ever had an insurance claim, you know, you, you have the number you, you've been paying for, you asked for. No idea what it's going to come back and what a settlement number will be and no idea when those funds will come in the same way as any of us have our own personal insurance claims. So uh, yes, it is. An, that is an, it's an active item on any expense on a show. Again, it depends uh, if the producers of that show took a larger policy or smaller one on business interruption. And that again, that will fit in to the overall financial picture of the show, but it's too soon to know how that's going to work or what those numbers are going to be. 
And the relief funds, are you guys going to get anything from that or no idea? You know, again, I, that's why I, I, I listen to what the governor has to say. I listen to what we listen to what the mayor has to say. I think there's a lot that we don't know. I think for us to reopen, uh, it, there will be a combination of some government aid, maybe some civic e efforts, maybe some fundraising, maybe some corporate under, underwriting, private funds, um, you know, individual producers or businesses, uh, depending on what type of business they are, whether they've applied for SBA loans, whether they furloughed employees, whether they've got employees that are just on, people are on unemployment. Again, it depends on the nature of your business in theater. You know, everybody's own, how they run their own business. Uh, we just had actually the Broadway League had a wonderful, um, we had a Zoom yesterday with uh, top accountants in the Broadway industry, giving some very, very good advice and a lot of different questions because again, there are people that have, you know, offices with 40 people and there are people that have one assistant. So everybody, and, and, and they're different types of corporations or LLCs, so they're, they're running their businesses differently. So uh, obviously I have more questions, but we have some questions that people are asking. Actually a very famous producer, uh, I'm not sure if I can reveal the name, so I will not at this point, okay. is asking the following. How do you envision future attendance? How are you thinking of handling seatings, keeping in mind social distancing? temperature checks at the door and stuff like that? Okay, great question because we talk about it all the time. You know, a lot of this is going to, um, a lot of what's going to happen in the theater, of course, is going to be a lot of decision-making by the theater owners because they're the landlords. And I, I know that they're, everybody's looking into right now uh, optimum cleaning and protections going forward. How is it going to be handled? Live theater, entertainment, even if it's, whether it's Broadway or if it's concert, if you look at it, it doesn't really work with social distancing because you're there for that live experience, for that exchange of energy of an audience with actors and back and forth and hearing the person three rows over laughing and that makes you laugh more, or crying and that makes you sniffle. So we are an industry that really will and does rely on uh, the crowd effect. Now, uh, will it be a matter of when people feel comfortable in being in a group? You know, there's a lot of medical issues here involved in terms of are we all waiting to find out uh, more testing? Will there be antibody testing? Uh, you know, again, there are so many questions on this that we are all sort of sitting back. All that we can do with individual shows, I believe, is be prepared, not when, but look at our show and go, what do we need to do to get our show back? What's our marketing campaign gonna be? How are we gonna welcome audiences? So whatever, if our show is coming back, we'd like you to buy tickets to see us and remind you that we're here. I will say that I know that there will be a lot of cross marketing. You know, I remember the old I Love New York campaign of uh, just welcoming people back, you know, come to the city, come to New York. Again, because Broadway needs New York City, New York City needs Broadway. We, we, it's gonna be, you know, it, 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 it's a symbiotic like this. When is it going to happen? You know, I think we're all sitting back, not only as, as theater goers, but, you know, going to restaurants, getting together with friends, families that have been, been distancing, you know, with, uh, whether it's with your children, with your spouse, with significant partner. If you wound up getting caught because maybe for work reasons, you had to be in different places. How will you know when it is safe to come back together again? You know, I watch these stories of the doctors and nurses, some that I know who are, are serving as on front line, but they, they work for 48, 72 hours and they go home. And the thing they're the most nervous about is going home and God forbid giving anything to anyone in their family. So I think we are all going to be learning as we see how society goes back together. Broadway's not going to be the first business to come back. Live concerts aren't going to be the first business. Restaurants, you know, it's possible for maybe for a restaurant, if a restaurant has to only at 8 p.m., let's say, the, a prime hour for a reservation, have 50% booking, it may not, although you like a restaurant to be buzzy, but it may not take away from your dining and food experience. Uh, so that might be 
come back first, but I don't know if I personally envisioned a theater of one person and then two empty seats and then another person. And the economics of that don't work because remember, if we're putting the show back up, revving it up, whether if it's a musical with an orchestra, but getting everybody, you know, people are, are, are paid well, our actors and, and whatnot. We can't operate uh, efficiently with half an audience. You know, that's when shows look at, at, at the tail end of a show, when you look at this, making a decision if the show should be finished. You know, we might start off that way slowly, you know, just with ticket buying, but I don't think that would be the way that we want to reopen with those kind of, um, with that kind of a restriction. But again, I'm speaking personally, we have no idea because we don't know, what, you know, we don't know where we're going to be, where things are going to be in two weeks or a month. And we're just going to take all the information but just know that when it does reopen, it's not only the safety of audience members, we need the safety of our actors. There are actors with people that are dancing and sweating next to each other and having romantic scenes. And this again is gonna be even for television and film, which can come back sooner because it may not be as many bodies in a room when they're filming something, but you're still asking people to get physically intimately close with each other in many situations. And actors have to be protected. And I'm sure the, the actors and their managers and agents, everybody's thinking about that. I mean, I would have thought, I mean, trying to be hopeful, um, you know, when you're going to, uh, it, once they open it uh, for business and people go to work, the minute you're going on a train from Rye to New York and you're going to, sit to, uh, to, to Ground Central or you take right. a subway, you already met thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Like and, 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 and way more crowded than you'll ever be at a Broadway show. So I think once they get to that point, I mean, I know it's not essential, but it doesn't matter. If I'm, if I'm stuck on a subway, I might as well go to see an Elton John show. I, I, you know what? And I'm glad that you feel that way. And, and I, I agree with you because now, you know, will people first be going out on the mask and gloves and hand washing and doing all the things that we need to do? We should have been doing what need to do. I think you know, we cannot answer for the psychology of, uh, of a ticket buying audience. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're feeling, well, I'm taking the train, I can go to a show. And we will hope that other people feel that when society reopens, and once we're given a green light, that people will feel comfortable and say, okay, we're doing better. And I've taken precautions, and we've moved on. And now I feel comfortable. I've missed, I've missed theater, I've missed a concert, I've missed you know, of, of, of that moment. And, 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 and I want to share that with my, with my friends and my children and my family. So we hope so. But I, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying and you're right. But again, it's like with any product, we can't, you know, when will we feel comfortable? You know, the, the, we, we, you get a food delivery and we, we put on our gloves and we get the rubbing alcohol and we wash our, our orange off. When will we say, okay, we don't have to Maybe we don't have to go that far anymore. So I think it's going to be a progression of events of, you know, most, you know, food source, you know, important, you know, coming down to, okay, I feel comfortable doing this now. I feel comfortable doing this now. Uh, and it's going to go, you know, even just getting, for my industry, getting actors back in, in a room together uh, who have not been uh, socially distancing with others. I found it find it interesting how there were groups of people that when they were told, you know, all right, you have to quarantine, that uh, were friends that got together and said, we don't want to be alone. So here's eight of us and we decided we're in a house and we're, we decided to stay together. Um, you know, when does everybody, when will we be allowed to do that? And that will, will tell us when all these other things can happen. And um, unlike other industries, especially unlike film, you guys have to keep the actors in shape. You have, they have to practice all the time. Now they don't even have shows for a while. Well, so what's going on with, with all of that? I mean, what do they do? If you go on and troll on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, actors are, I've seen, I mean, the, there are Rockettes giving dance classes. There are uh, Robin Herter, one fabulous dancer. She's in Moulin Rouge. She's been showing some of her routines. I mean, I'm just naming a, a teeny bit of what's going on. They're doing that on Instagram, but I will tell you this, that anyone, as just as someone who performed a long time ago, they are taking good care of their bodies, their voices. They are vocalizing. If they are using the back of a chair as a ballet bar, they are, they are practicing, they are staying, they are doing their best to stay in shape. If they're somewhere, I've, I know friends, actor friends, you know, work on the country where they can be outside. 
they're jogging, they're running. There are people that are just getting together with scripts of shows or our, whether it's the show they're on or just other prairies, just to keep the instrument in tune. Um, and there's some wonderful things going on. There's uh, Seth Rudetsky has this, uh, he's, I think it's Facebook and Instagram and, and YouTube. It's called uh, Stars in the House. 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. every day, he's getting together cast of not only Broadway shows, but of TV shows, current and past. And people are talking, sometimes people are singing together. I saw a few days, ago, uh, well, the cast of Hamilton, the original Hamilton, uh, I think it was a Zoom screen of 26 people that sang the opening number for this nine-year-old girl uh, who had tickets and couldn't get there. The reunion, ca the um, revival cast of Chorus Line just a couple of days ago, they were celebrating an anniversary. They got about 14 or 15 of them and each one filmed, ha had filmed themselves dancing the opening number and it was on a Zoom camera. So. Actors are like, actors and performers are in that same world as athletes. What are athletes doing now? I'm sure any athlete that's quarantined is doing uh, their a full physical routine. Actors, they're, they're doing their work, as are the musicians. They're not home twiddling their thumbs. And, um, and, and when you look at uh, Broadway, and, uh, and I'm, I don't know if you'll have an answer for that, but what's going to happen with everybody? I mean, once everything goes into place, what do you do with the tens of thousands that bought tickets that are they get just got canceled and they're gonna start doing it from you know just gonna order again or you need to first fill the house with them or what yeah. well, again depending on when how far we are told you know june 7th is the date right now if that june 7th gate gets extended let's say by the government to that we're told to extend to august 1st or what i'm just as, as making my date up uh, then there's the obligation to refund tickets until then. So whenever we reopen, let's say we reopen in September and you have tickets for September 15th, those tickets will be good. If you had tickets for July and your tickets were refunded, uh, you can come back into the system and then repurchase tickets. You're not gonna be automatically moved. Again, I really haven't been on that. I haven't been looking that closely on that system. I've really been looking more at the actual shows and what's going on with the shows because I'm not involved with the refund part, but I think it will be, that's why the marketing campaigns will be so important for us to be, when we know we're going back out, it's, it'll be okay for us to come back and spend the money to remind people we're, we're, we're reopening, we're gonna be here, buy your tickets or rebuy your tickets. And then uh, I have a question here from Desiree uh, Petno, a good friend. Uh, Hi Desiree. You know her, of course, from the West Coast. How are you guys doing there? Um, you spoke about the new delivery of entertainment. Can you expand on that? You know, I don't know if it's really a new delivery. I just think there's a new audience for it. Uh, you know, my daughter does not have a television set in her apartment because her entertainment, she picks and chooses what she wants from whether it's a Netflix or an Amazon or on YouTube. And I have found that with many of, of her friends. Uh, whereas more generation, more a little bit more old school and a little bit more accustomed to uh, TV programming. So I think what's happened now is there's a generation where I might necessarily, well, listen, I, I, I'm in theater most nights. So I really had to, I would pick and choose what somebody told me, this series on Netflix is fabulous, you must watch it, or on Amazon or something that I had to go on demand to get. But now I'm much more accustomed and know how to access uh, programming uh, that's all that's been out there so I'm assuming that other people of a certain of generations that were not really looking at other methods of, of, of getting their entertainment now know just they, we know how to do it and I just feel like other there will be possibly more programming going in that direction because people will just be more accustomed, that we're not accustomed to watching entertainment as we're doing it now, as we're communicating now. Um, this will become, you know, I wonder what's gonna happen even with meetings. You, you know, even when we have meetings for our shows, you know, we have an ad meeting or an advertising meeting. A lot of times there's always the call-in option because some people of our partners are out of town, but it's always nice to be there and be with people. But we've all gotten so accustomed to this Zoom, we're getting accustomed to the Zoom format uh, will that become more the regular? So 
And I, I, yes, I think there's just a lot, there's a lot of stuff going on in the tech world right now as well. So I think that uh, the innovations in entertainment, um, in virtual reality, augmented reality, I mean, I'm working on a project that's, uh, you know, will a little postponed, but it will be augmented reality. It will need people to be there in the room, but their experience of, of what the entertainment will be different. Uh, it's going to be moving forward no matter what, but you know, live theater goes back to the Greeks. And I think there is still uh, the moment, the experience of being in the room with other people, with live actors that cannot be, uh, you, you can't replicate that. You can't get that from a screen. And that's why those of us that love live entertainment, why do we go to concerts when you can just download the music? Why do, you know, why do, why do, we, why do we go sit in a room with 20,000 people? Why is Billy Joel, who I adore, hasn't written a new song in 20 years, but he has had, 70, 80 sold out concerts in the garden because we want to see him live and we want to be in that room where everybody's singing along and enjoying that moment. It's a community experience and that's human. That's magic, that's in entertainment, of course, with the uh, performing arts. And, um, and let's forget just a second the corona thing and, and, and talk about Broadway is Broadway. How has Broadway been regardless in the, let's say just before they started in the last 10 years, has it been doing well? I'm having, it was such a good season. Um, you know, it, things were moving along extremely well. I had some great new musicals. You had Moulin Rouge and Jagged Little Pill and Tina uh, were, were, you know, were great. Off Broadway, Little Shop of Horrors, the revival doing great. And that's another conversation we didn't even have about Off Broadway, which might come back before Broadway because they're smaller rooms. So just sidebar about live entertainment, you know, that's a possibility. Again, we don't know. Um, uh, great plays. I mean, shows still running. Hades Town, which won uh, eight Tonys last year. The Dear Evan Hansen. Uh, 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 Beetlejuice could be making uh, a reappearance. Uh, Ain't Too Proud, The Temptations. Oh, if I leave any out, they'll kill me. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, an absolutely gorgeous play. And some plays that were coming, you know, the ones that I mentioned that were in previews and getting ready to come in. Things were just going really strong and well, you know, uh, Broadway, uh, many theaters, uh, you know, let alone Hamilton, which is, uh, you know, just magnificent and remains packed. Uh, the Disney shows, you know, uh, always, uh, you know, Lion King was the first show I took my son to. And uh, when he was four years old, you know, incredible. So, you know, Broadway was doing very well, you know, up until all this happened. The biggest discussion was frustration because I, I want to get my show in and there isn't an available theater. You know, I mean, we all wish we could go back to the things that we worried about eight, nine weeks ago, uh, which are no longer in the discussion because now when Broadway comes back, uh, you know, we don't know, we trust that shows, shows will come back, but again, I'm not part of every, I can't answer for every show. And when the new shows that were going to come in, when will they come in? Because they have to re-gear up. But Broadway was, was, was moving along well. I mean, you heard the numbers, you know? Uh, things and were, when, were- And when you look from a perspective of an investor, yes. um, is there any correlation between the size of the production and risk? I mean, I would have thought that unless you're Disney that can get away with huge productions, if you're a single investor and you're going to something huge, it's risky because obviously the production is so expensive. Is there a correlation between risk factor and... and, and... It's a good question because the first thing, we're talking about uh, the arts. So hey, King the Kong, by the way, sorry, I, I, I went to see King Kong. I will not tell you what I think about the, that show at the time. But I'm not involved with it. But I know, I know. But, but just to think about how much money they, I mean, they started already at a point where they need to make such a great success in order to, to, to make anything here. Well, here's what it boils down to, whether it's a piece of theater or it's a product, another industry. If the, if the product is good, if it's something that people are going to want to see and the product is good, and you, even if it's expensive, but you have priced it ap appropriately, and if it's in the right theater, you know, if, if you've really put all those elements together, you know, I'm involved with Moulin Rouge, which was a very expensive show. But I remember I saw an er a workshop, early workshop of it. I saw the second preview performance up in Boston. 
and I just sat there. It was, it is so entertaining that I, I felt that for myself as an investor and for investors that people are going to walk out of here, feel they got their, their, they got their money's worth as, as ticket buyers and they're going to come back. They're going to tell people to come. And that's a show that has been doing knocking on some wood over here very well and was trending, um, in the same, it, it didn't matter if it cost, you know, $2 million or, or, or $30 million. It was still, it was, re, it was starting to repay investors in a very good, smooth manner. You can have a show that's a two-hander, that's a play that you do very inexpensively, but if it isn't good, it doesn't matter that it was inexpensive. So it's just the same, you know, with any service or product, you, you, you get what you pay for. Of course, I, you know, we look at the numbers. I know that when I'm presented with a show, if I'm not part of the original, but I'm just presented with a show and I'm looking at the numbers, I look at the art, the artistry of the show and look at the numbers um, and try in my mind, you know, does it, is this all making sense? <clears throat> and of course the theater, the theater that you put your show into, where your show winds up is, is very important. You don't put a two-hander in a barn. You can't put too big a show in a smaller theater. You know, there's a, just a lot of conversations about um, waiting for the right theater or waiting, holding your show to put your show in the right theater as well. Excuse me. Now, I want to understand, you know, from the uh, perspective of Broadway as an investment, how the numbers work, but maybe before that, you went from your, after you sold your family business into Broadway, right. obviously there's no price tag to excitement, right? It's a passion investment when people invest in art, in toys, in, in film, in Broadway, it makes them, you know, excited. You w went into Broadway purely because you felt it was exciting or you actually thought I'm going to actually make it a profitable business as well? Well, you know, of course I went into it. My, my, my dear, my mentor, Bill, you know, I, who mentored me, he said, you love this so much. You understand it. You understand the creative. Obviously, I needed to learn more about the business side. Uh, and as I learned the business side, I became an investor because I, I said, well, the only way I'm going to learn this and I have to put my money where my mouth is, especially if down the road, I want to ask other people to put their money in. And I, I, I learned how to read the financial statements. And as time has gone on, make my own uh, opinion. And of course, with, with, with other partners that, you know, people that I consider to be very small and successful, uh, do these elements work? If we've got this is the material. These are the actors. This is what it is. This is what audiences are looking for. What are the trends? So, of course, my initial uh, interest in going in was because I loved it. But when I was starting to take it really seriously, first with my own money, and then a couple of years down the road, really learning it and really understanding, uh, and then asking other people to trust me or trust my, my, my judgment, and the way that I always, when I, when I bring some project to, to somebody as an investor, I always give the reasons why I feel, here's why I like it. And I, I list the reasons. It's this director, it's this actor, it's this choreographer, it's this material. It's, it was Arthur Miller, the, a brilliant playwright. It's, a, it's the newest brilliant playwright. You know, I always look for the reasons why I'm going to put money in it. The same way, you know, when I go to your you know, your wonderful days, and I'm listening to people talking about what they're working on in an industry that I may not know well, uh, I'm listening for the same thing, which is, um, tell me why you like it. Tell me why your money is in it. You're working in it. Tell me why your money is in it. Tell you why you think I, tell, tell me why you think I should put my money in it. So I, I try to present, I presented it as if somebody was presenting me the same situation, but in an industry that I might not be as familiar with. And I actually invest in other Broadway shows. I'm an investor in Broadway shows where I'm not a producer because I do believe in the model and I feel like I know it well enough to know, well, that's not my show, but I think that's going to do well. I'm not a producer of Hamilton at all, but I was fortunate enough to be at a very early workshop and, you know, be able to uh, ask, you know, I, I think, I think there's something genius here. I would love to have any, you know, small involvement. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. I, and, you know, and I have to ask you this about Broadway, you know, because it's funny, you know, if you would have told me, if you would have told me, uh, listen, you got uh, this project with you two and Spider-Man. Um, you got a project with Elton John and vampires. I would have told you this is a winner without even thinking twice. Right. 
And then you told me, well, there's something with dirty jokes, uh, Avenue Q kind of a thing. There's uh, another one that is like a, sort of like a, a crazy humor, like South Park kind of a Mormons laughing at project. Or there's a rap kind of a, of a, of a project on Broadway. I would have told you, I don't see all the tourists from China going to these kind of courses. I mean, it's really, really funny. You see, the, the biggest successes were amazing failures and things that people didn't dream of became... You know, I called up a couple of people. I had gone to a workshop of a show and I called them up and I said, it moved me emotionally. The second song is this high school boy that's alienated. I cried because it, 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 it struck me. My kid, I had you know, kids in, from high, in high school. Um, and then he, there's someone that he doesn't know and they commit suicide and they go, what? No, I don't want any part of that. How many of my investors and friends said, and you didn't force me to invest in Dear Evan Hansen? I said, I don't force anyone to do anything. And I know it sounded quirky, but there was a resonance in a heart. And I will tell you, there is a hashtag you will be found, not even campaign. I mean, the show was really discovered by a teen, a younger generation telling their parents, I've heard this music, you've got to get tickets to the show when it comes in. But it has now circled the internet, it, it continues to circle the internet and the at you will be found, uh, especially at this moment of telling people if you're alone, if you're scared, there's somebody, we're here for you. The show, the message of the show resonated on such a deep level. Um, Spider-Man is an interesting story. I was not involved, although I was asked to look at the material somewhere in the middle. I did sign a, a non-disclosure, but a lot of things just sort of went wrong. And there's actually a very interesting book written about it. Uh, I think the, one of the main thing was, is, you know, I, I always look when I'm involved with something, especially with a lead, you know, where I'm asked to come on a team, who also are the lead partners on it? And who's, who else is putting money into it? And um, I, a lot of times that, that, that sort of, hmm, they're pretty smart. Whatever they touch usually does, usually does really well. So again, in any other industry, you know, isn't that always sort of a key of, well, geez, they've had success in this, this, and this. If they're liking it, that sounds strange, but maybe that's the next, you know, the next big thing. Um, I think especially in the arts, we have to be open and tastes are shifting. Now it's gonna be interesting to see when Broadway does come back. You know, I, I found that myself, I've been, when need be, taking some solace in watching this, net, this TV network, TCM, the Turner broadcast. It's the old musicals, a lot of the old movies and, and musicals. And a lot of them, some of them from the, the Busby Berkeley, uh, Ziegfeld style from the 30s and 40s. And wondering, you know, people needed an outlet then of that kind of grand entertainment of musicals to be um, to be lifted up. So again, once everybody is given the safety, uh, feel safe to come back out and comfortable coming back out, and we know we can go back out, is this gonna be what's gonna enliven everybody? Because we're gonna wanna just be <sighs> lifted up. But you know what's, what's even stranger about Broadway is that you know in the film industry, I can at least, I mean, nobody has a crystal ball, but you can at least predict to some extent that the Russo brothers, they did Captain America and all these shows, they're probably going to do well in their next movie, even if they, even if it sucks, uh, or 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 a famous, uh, you know, uh, actor would probably make the movie work, even if the movie sucks. In Broadway, I mean, again, when, when you're talking about Elton John, Elton John writing a musical, and it's a huge, huge flop, and Andrew Lloyd Webber, even even you cannot even go back to the biggest names in history, and he made several flops one after another. It's very hard to you know what's going to I'm how people sure. react. In every industry you've got, and we look back in history, there were brilliant inventors and business people that had successes, or maybe they had their failures early on and then had a success, or it just, the elements just didn't work. I don't think, you know, I like this. In baseball, if a batter hits about 300, 330, they're a genius, they're the best of the year. I don't think we're expected, you know, to bat a thousand uh, on every Broadway show. And then I, I remember um, the vampire. I don't remember it that well, but the Elton John's music was a part of it. But again, I wasn't involved in the production, so who's to say the other elements 
that made that not work? Were there script issues? Were there actor issues? Again, I'm not saying there were, but you know, I would have to go look at that individual show. Spider-Man, uh, off the you know, off record, I could, you know, tell you some other things, but every show you kind of have to look at and say, this didn't work for these reasons. I mean, there are times that's why I, you know, we go to workshops of a lot of things. Part of what I do as a producer. It's not only in New York City when there are, are, are workshops. I mean, I read plays and right now I'm seeing some things online, but I travel, whether it's to London or around the country. And there were times I've said to myself, I can't believe I took a plane and I paid for a hotel to see this. But it's part of what I do and part of what we try to prevent audiences in New York from having to do. <laughs> and then, you know, we haven't spoken about the most important part, I think, as, as, as a potential investor is to understand from you, A, if I want to get into Broadway, um, what should I be asking? What questions? I think you talked about it a little bit, but the numbers, how does it work? What do I get? I know that you get access to premieres and it's fun and all of that, but how does it work? When do you see money coming back? Um, okay. Should you go after Broadway as an investment or you should say, listen, it's a risky place, uh, but it's fun and you'll probably make money as well, but take it, you know, under, what would you advise others? How does it work really? You know, you know, I have been uh, fortunate as an investor, but not, and not every show is done well. It's a matter of it all averaging out. Because um, I sort of run mine like a mutual fund, but without putting the fund together. But I usually do a, a, a couple of shows a season. So there's a bit of an offering and, you know, you can try a big musical and a smaller play. It's, it's almost like different investment type, you know, different modes, shorter term, maybe big star, longer term, more expensive, but if it works, can make more money down the long run. Uh, the way that it works is, um, you know, we go to investors, we put, we put, we put our funds together. Uh, investors, as the show, once the show opens, we have a capitalization budget, meaning everything that we spend on a show before the show goes into a first uh, performance. Uh, and sometimes there's a reserve fund, there's advances and bonds but that's, so we capitalize it. Then there's the weekly expenses of what the show is gonna cost us to run. And again, getting into different shows, it depends if you've been part of the show when it was out of, if we've done a financing before, out of town, in town, there's a lot of different level, you know, ways and timing of investments as well. But then once we start on Broadway, basically we refund, investors get recouped before producers make money. There might be a small, uh, you know, weekly fee for just running the show, but we don't take profits or money until investors get paid back. So I might get money back on a show as if I'm an investor, but until everybody's at 100%, I don't see, no matter how much work on time I've put in, I don't see money. Once we make our money back, uh, every dollar going forward is split in 50%. It's 50%. So 50% go to investors and the other 50% are split among anybody that's got what we would call a back end deal whether it's producers, certain creators, you know, sometimes some, an actor has part of that 50% of a big director might, you know, again, it just depends on the deals. So that's when a producer would make money, but you as an investor, you get made whole first, and then you're part of that 50%. The next benefit comes, uh, the national tours can turn out to be huge money makers because a lot of the theaters in the cities uh, that the towns that we visit are much larger. Some of them can be double the size of a Broadway theater. So you've got a much larger capa you know, a capacity for audience, for ticket buyers. And a lot of these theaters are subscription. So you kind of know, you've already know you've got a, a, a pre-sold ticket because people are buying the five show season. So you know your ticket sold. And that is sort of a, a benefit for investors in the mother company on Broadway, uh, primarily musicals, although a few, plays do tour. You know, Curious Incident had a wonderful tour. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird is going to go on tour. Some plays do tour, but it's usually uh, the musicals. But, uh, and you, uh, investors have the right, but not the obligation. And even to invest in those tours, which can be, again, nice money-making opportunities. But even if you don't invest, you're still part of the mother company uh, royalty pool and you, you will benefit. And then there's London and then there's the rest of the world. And then there's every university and regional theater and community theater that might license uh, that show and perform it for years to come. So that's looking at it as an investment. You know, we, we, it's always stated in the papers, your, your investment documents, it, it's usually pretty well stated. You could lose your money, but it, it's an investment for people that, um, 
of, you know, enjoying the arts is usually a large part of it, but there is the money making opportunity, the same way that people might put money in a restaurant or a horse or certain other things that they that they enjoy. You know, for people that have a, a particular piece or percentage of their disposable, you know, uh, of their money and say, uh, okay, I've made this, I'm, I'm secure, I've got my, my, my stocks, my bonds, and here's where I want to play a little bit, and they play with plays. And if I was a monkey, unlike you that know to ask the right questions, figure out who is involved and all of that, if I would just try to, you know, invest in Broadway shows, what's the percentage that I'll get it right? I mean, what's the percentage of shows that actually make it? Uh, um, the statistic is about 20% uh, recouping and then the rest making percentages of, of money, but that doesn't take in, you can have a show that does not recoup on Broadway. If you're just talking Broadway, you might get to 50%, 80%, but because of the national tour, investors can be recouped and then make money on top of that. Mm -hmm. And then you're not taking into the account the vast amount of money that uh, those, the shows that do make money can make. So, uh, you know, uh, Chicago, a Wicked, a Book of Mormon, Hamilton's, you know, many, many more. So again, it depends. You can quote numbers to make it look bad, but you can quote numbers that really tell the story that uh, it looks good. I mean, I th from what I understand, venture capital, uh, a lot of those investments maybe have a 10% shot of, of, of making money. So, you know, maybe Broadway's not so bad. You know, the, um, I'm sure it's not. Uh, it's a great uh, place if you know what you're doing. And that's why I think, you know, um, well, that's the, the, that's, that's, your experience, obviously. I, same way that I, when I come to your, 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 your days and I hear your experts, I would tell anybody, or I have a friend call me up and go, my uncle wants to invest in a Broadway show. What do you think? And I don't even ask them what the show is first. I say, whom are they speaking with? Because... If, if they tell me they're at least speaking with somebody that I know or I know their track record or has been around, I go, okay, well, they're good. You know, they've been around. They know their stuff. Um, now, what's the show? Invest, you know, you, you need to, you know, be, be, put your money with somebody who you, you know has a pretty good idea of what they're doing. But that would be, that's your stockbroker. That's anybody. That's your, you know, I, I, I want my doctor to be the best doctor. I want my plumber to know how to fix, you know, my sink. Go with the best, you know, you, you, you need to go with people with the, with the best experience and who, who, who know what they're doing in, you know, any, in any level of making an investment. You know, one of the, uh, growing up in Israel, uh, one of the most uh, famous stadiums in Israel is called the Bloomfield Stadium. I don't know if you heard about that one. And uh, I'm mentioning that because we have Harry Bloomfield here uh, from Montreal, and he's asking you a question. Uh, a little bit gloomy, but uh, um, are you ready for the possibility that things will never be the same? Can, can you imagine two years of masked audiences sitting in every other seat? I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but I... Uh... You, my, Heather reminded me of this. My daughter reminded me of this. So I remember telling my kids uh, when they were yellow, the only thing you can count on is you can't really count on much of anything except that your parents will always love you um, and that life is a surfboard and be ready to surf have good core strength because life is a surfboard uh, of course it's going to change you know things changed after 9 11 you know and uh, which something depending on the age of our children some don't know any differently because they grew up already in that world you know some remember the more of the freedom of just getting on an airplane or used to get back in the day, get dressed to get on an airplane. So of course there's going to be changes. Do we know how the changes are going to be or what the changes are going to be? Nothing that we can predict right now, because again, and who would have thought we'd be here on August 20, uh, April 20th. I don't know where we're going to be on August 20th or what our conversation is going to be. I think what we are all trying to do is be prepared for re-entry, both on the, uh, each show on the financial side and on the artistic side and you know take it from there if it's one if it's six months a year two years if people are wearing masks or people are not wearing masks we don't know you know it's again it's not only the safety of the audiences but it's the safety of our actors and our talent and of the people working backstage so i think it's just going to be a full community effort on you know we're going to decide how we all choose to live and re-enter the world so 
you know, believe me, I don't know how well anybody else is sleeping. I, I do my best. I meditate. But of course, we, we think about everything. We think about uh, they're finding a cure tomorrow. And we're thinking about it may not be tomorrow. So all that we can really do is um, make some plans, think things through, have some different scenarios and take it day by day. That's why, you know, we, we are, even though it's not good to listen to the news for too much, it's too long, but we have to stay on top of it. And I'm very fortunate to be a member of the Broadway League. The Broadway League has, uh, again, that's my, my, the organization that represents the producers as well as, you know, theater owners. But um, they've got about 15 different committees of uh, task force uh, looking at every possible angle of what's going on. There's a subcommittees look, just looking at national tours. There's government committees, marketing committees, interfacing, you know, with, with the restaurant tours in the neighborhood. So there is, I, I'm, I feel very comfortable that I know that what will happen is going to happen in, a, in the proper manner and the best safety of everybody. And right now, the only thing we can concentrate on is, is just that everybody get healthy and be healthy and hopefully those those terrible statistics just go down because that's what's really the most important thing and then we can start concentrating on on the comeback now uh, we, i mean i knew you will be an exciting person to speak to that's why we've been here for over an hour now and people don't stop asking questions so maybe just not one another one other My question Somebody's asking here, is it possible to duplicate success of Hamilton with a second cast so, the, so to shorten wait time to get tickets? How are ticket prices determined? How ticket prices, yeah, that's it. That's basically the question. Okay. Ticket prices are, you know, when, when you price a show out, um, you know, there's sort of, and, and we always do it, uh, it's always, ticket pricing is always done in conversation with the theater owners and the box office. You know, basically there's like an average for play, an average for a musical. You look at who your talent is. And then it also, it becomes, um, you know, if you've got a show that's going to turning out to be a hit, you carefully maybe scooch the numbers up. If you have a show that uh, maybe the word hasn't, of mouth hasn't gone out yet, you run some promotions. So again, it's kind of like a, a pricing for air flights. You know, I could be paid full price. The person next to me could be on mileage points. The other guy could be somewhere in the middle, got a flight on Expedia. We don't, so it's, it's, it's dynamic pricing. In terms of Hamilton, if you're just using that show, um, you know, I, I would think that'll be one of the shows that will be in, the, in, in high demand. So I don't think there'll be price, you know, no, nobody's looking to take advantage. It's a parent of, you know, it is a bit of a riskier business. And if you wind up having a product that's doing well, it's sort of what the market will bear. And by the and way, in Chicago, in, I'm sorry to, in Chicago, I saw Hamilton and you wouldn't believe the prices are very, very low relatively to New York to see. Well, the prices in, to run the show in Chicago, remember it's a tour cast. So national tours cost less than Broadway. It's different. It's just your, your, your expenses are less. Your theater rent is probably less. Your actors are A-list actors, but they're on a different pay scale. You know, I was down in Miami back in, in February and Hamilton was opening at the Adrian Arsh Center, beautiful, gorgeous theater center. And it was opening there. And I had it in my mind, you know, I, I, I'm going to catch it one night. And they were getting really good money for it, but it was the first time it was in Miami. And it was, it was selling out really well. So again, it, it, it's a combination of, and you know, prices vary at holiday season. Prices come down a bit, you know, midwinter. You know, there's always the Broadway weeks or the two for one, bring your kid for free. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, there's patterns in pricing based on the season. When the, when the award nominations would come out, if your show got a, a good amount of nominations, you know, you could be looking at it, you know, a lot of conversation and deep thought goes into, into pricing. It's not a frivolous, let's throw a number out there and see if we get it. It's a lot of thought and, and conversation that goes into it. And Wendy, maybe I'll finish with, um, obviously there's no business like show business. Um, everybody, everybody, all the VCs, the private equity, the Wall Street, the retail, doesn't matter what you do, the magic comes at night when you see the show. And, um, and, I, and again, I come from a family where it was always in the air and there's nothing like it. It's just nothing. You cannot explain it otherwise. And you sign every email of yours. I pay attention to your emails. 
with uh, a George Eliot quote, right? It is never too late to be what we might have been. So. Well, I love George Eliot. I love her for a lot of reasons. So we, we, we won't even touch on that, 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 that part of it. Um, I, I, the universe brought me back to my, to this work and to a passion in life, uh, in midlife, you know, I, I'm fortunate. I, I speak it often at um, career days, whether it's universities or companies with young people. And I always say, do not feel that your first job has to be your last job. If you're picking your major, you're not stuck. That doesn't mean, or if you're in a job right now at, at 22 or at 30 or at 40, it does not mean that this is going to define you and this is who you have to be. And that quote meant a lot to me because I got some dis a few naysayers when I ch when I moved into the entertainment industry at a at an age where um, you know although Broadway's pretty really been wonderful live theater's been wonderful I'm not sure film and TV I know skews young younger but uh, I never really faced any uh, ageism at all but it was more to me about feeling you know enjoy live your life. And do, you know, follow your passion. And if you really love what you're doing, what's the expression? If you love what you're doing, the money will follow. So look what's going on now. We're in a world where people, careers are going to be changing. People may are waking up now and finding out they may not have a job. They don't know if their company is going to take them back. But maybe there's something they're good at. Maybe they're really good at what they do and they can be a consultant. Maybe there was something they were good at 10, 15 years ago and that's morphed. Uh, maybe there's an entire passion that they had. Maybe they've been growing some veggies. They're going to grow some veggies in the garden. Um, you know, there's a, fun, a movie on from the 80s. We watched it the other night, Diane Keaton. I forget the name of it, but she was a bit, big ad exec. And she gets fired and she winds up, because she winds up having to uh, adopt a baby, uh, this child that uh, her, her, I think her late sister had a child. But anyway, she winds up with a baby. She gets fired from her big job, moves up to Vermont. And she winds up making an organic uh, food for, for children. And that business zooms. And she winds up turning down the company. They want to do her ad campaign at the end of the movie. And she says no. So mm -hmm. here's a problem. What is it? A problem that becomes an opportunity? I think many of us are sitting uh, right now and thinking, I'm not leaving Broadway. And I would never leave Broadway. But will I have be looking a little bit more at other opportunities? in maybe, like I said, taking some of these shows and, and going uh, web series or online with them or doing some other things, of course, because I'd be crazy not to. So I think uh, that's just, that quote is more meaningful now than when I put it up there. Amazing. Uh, uh, I think this is the only session we've done, Wendy, that's over an hour. And that's because <laughs> it's so know. interesting. And we could have gone for another one for easy. I have questions I didn't get to. Um, but listen, I, I thank you so much for- You're welcome to share my email address with anybody that would like to ask me anything because I love talking about theater. Sure. I mean, anybody uh, just reach out, uh, reach out and we'll be uh, happy to connect you. Um, and again, this week is about uh, the art world and, and, and film. And on Thursday, I will be speaking with um, the amazing Nancy Spielberg. Um, yeah, you should catch that one. Um, uh, she, she didn't, she wasn't just, uh, she's not going to talk only about her growing in probably one of the most magical families you can think of. Uh, I think her brother directed them as, the, you know, he directed the siblings when they were young at home. Um, and later on, she became a very successful producer herself. Um, the last one um, uh, was, I don't know if you heard of Above and Beyond, uh, an award-winning documentary about, you know, the, the planes when they were, I'm sorry? No, she's terrific. She's fantastic. Um, yeah, when, when, when we, they had the foreign and Israeli pilots that flew uh, uh, planes to Israel to defend the new state in 48. Uh, and now she's involved in other projects. So that's going to be happening on, on Thursday. Um, she's a philanthropist. She's a, a producer many uh, angles that I think we'll uh, be uh, able to cover. Um, and I would say, uh, let's everybody stay safe and, uh, and join me next week. We're talking with uh, uh, exceptional entrepreneurs, technology, and we'll keep on going because we believe in every uh, challenge brings opportunities and we are not uh, going to sit and not do anything about it. We're doing these webinars with exceptional people like yourself 
to hear about how to look at the uh, bright side and, and keep on going. So thank you. It was a pleasure, it was a real treat. Good to see you. Stay well, please, most importantly, stay well. All of you thank out you there, stay well. Everybody stay well, stay sane. Any last words, Wendy? When you're allowed to go back out, come see a Broadway show. Thank you very much. Everybody you. stay safe, we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>